tonight is going to be called Save the Wheel. And uh, it's an enormous honour to be invited to give this talk because it's the first of Michael Nathan's um, memorial talks about glass engraving. And Mar Michael was the great champion, the great champion of glass engravers right from the beginning of the Glass Engravers Guild, almost the first or second year they were established. And he, like anything he did, put his all into it. He gave generously, he supported generously, he and Jenny turned out, I think, for just about every conference, whether he was in a wheelchair and in the most difficult locations. And he just managed to help us along because we're a load of it's like herding chickens um herding glass engravers and although he got frustrated with us my goodness he was wonderful so he was a lay member and council member of the guild from 1978 and you can see this great list of things that he did and one of the most important things he did was persuade the glass sellers company to provide a trophy for the best first time exhibitor in a guild exhibition, which is a bit of a mouthful. But it did mean that up and coming glass engravers got a little bit of a launch. And if you look at the list of those people who did win that trophy, you'll find that most of them went on to become very competent and successful glass engravers. So, I'll now start into my talk, which I've called Save the Wheel. Um, if you come from Star Bridge, it would sound a bit like Save the Wild. But um, uh, when I gave the talk with the same title in 2002, that was one of the headlines on just about every billboard. We were all trying to save the whale. Um, why save the whale? Because particularly wheel engraving is the skill, craft skill that's becoming increasingly endangered. Within 50 years, it's almost died out in this country. And it's certainly dying out quite rapidly now right across Europe. And one of the problems is making it relevant to modern glass. So this is what I shall be talking about tonight. But I shall start first with explaining what wheel engraving is all about. It's not about engraving on wheels, it's using wheels to engrave glass. And the whole technique came originally from very primitive lathes in early Mesopotamia, possibly also in Egypt, where they would engrave little cylinder seals and scarabs using simple little lathes with wheels made out of copper. Why copper rather than steel when you're doing something, cutting something hard? It's because copper is a soft metal. And with, when it's got a little bit of friction and a little bit of pressure, the grit in a grit and oil mix stays in the copper long enough to cut into the glass or the stone. And you are able, even with very primitive lathes, you get marvelous effects. The picture on the left here is of Franz Josef Palmer, who joined Thomas Webbs in Starbridge in 1882. And that was probably the, the high tide from 1882 to about 1910 of, of glass engraving in Starbridge. There's no sign of glass, wheel engravers or even glass engravers in Roman times. There's, imported Roman glass, but there's no uh, archaeological evidence that there was ever any glass engraving going on in Britain. And then suddenly, um, with the Dutch and English invention of lead crystal in the 17th century, and the technique coming from Caspar Lehmann in Saxony, and via probably some Islamic and Roman continuations and further east, it became part of the language of glass in this country. But really the masters 
of will engraving tended to come from Bohemia. And it was our great good fortune that uh, life in Central Europe in the 1840s onwards was very politically unstable. And many of these Bohemians came to work in Britain, bringing with them this marvelous technique for engraving glass. Here you see a little brass lathe with lead bearings carrying interchangeable spindles with the wheels on them. And in this little pot here is his grit and oil mix, which he smears onto the wheel. And now I'm going to just quickly play you a clip from a, a, a YouTube video. You can see the whole video if you go to my website, but I should just play a quick um, section of it just to show you what the copper wheel actually looks like. Um, here it is mounted on a steel spindle. Sorry, there's a little bit of it. And the grit is smeared onto the wheel and that, that's what's cutting the glass. Um, you can see all my wheels here on my rack. You make as many wheels as you want out of scrap copper. So you have to flatten carefully, drill a hole in it, and then put it onto a steel spindle and knock the end over to make a rivet. And uh, it's quite a trial when you're a beginner not to have the wheel bouncing, wobbling about. And I think that's what puts off students. It's, uh, it's really um, so I was trying just to get the sound of the wheel on the glass. Never mind. Um, you can see the idea anyway. There's a little tongue of leather here, and that's how the, it's a bit messy. I think that's what puts off engravers as well. But um, never mind. It's, it's a much more versatile form of glass engraving um, than it looks because you can get the finest of lines and the biggest, you can make massive great wheels as well and thereby you can have a wheel for every occasion as it were whereas in any other form a stone wheel or a diamond sintered diamond wheel um, you can only afford as, unless you're um, a, a millionaire uh, a certain number of wheels whereas if it's made out of scrap copper you can make a wheel to suit whatever you're wanting to do here on the left is a little bohemian brass lathe one of five which Peter Duck pulled out of a skip outside an old factory in Star Bridge. Um, we got set up at Morley and it was on one of those that I learned to do copper wheel engraving. Problem with these old lathes is that the centre of the drive shaft here into which you put the spindle was hollowed out by hand and each one is different so you can't interchange spindles between lathes. Here on the right is Peter Dreiser. Peter Dreiser taught me. He was taught in his, in his, uh, at the Rheinbach Glass School in Germany just after the war, uh, when the German government had the great sense to round up all the refugee masters of engraving and enameling who were thrown out of the Sudetenland for being German uh, after the war by the Czechs. It was the Czechs' uh, disadvantage. Um, and Peter had a wonderful training at Rheinbach, with whom I still have connections there. But Peter was a great teacher, and he happened to be at this um, adult education college in Lambeth, where I managed to learn from him. These days, students don't like getting their hands dirty, nor do they like um, particularly um, spending uh, three or four years having to make their wheels stop wobbling and, and make a, an achievable cut. I think uh, it requires a certain degree of patience that few people have these days. Um, it certainly took me many, many years to be able to make a, a respectable mark on the glass. So these little portable lathes are more like sewing machines and you can put into them spindles with uh, sintered diamond wheels on them which are clean because you use a water drip 
and you get an instant cut. You don't have to make your wheel anymore. But the problem is each wheel costs about four or five hundred pounds when they're that size. So you can't have that many wheels and therefore not so much flexibility about what shape of cut you're going to make on the glass. Um, the other thing is I was going to point out is that you can probably see quite well here is that where I've got the contact with the glass um, is actually out of sight of my eye line. And that's another thing that tends to put off beginners because they say, I can't see where I'm cutting because you can't stick your head right round the side and stay in balance. Um, but then I say, well, if you're driving a car, you don't stick your head out of the window to see the, the tires on the road, do you? And when you're parking the car, you can't see the bumper and yet you get used to doing it. And it's exactly the same with the glass engraving. You engrave on the underneath of the wheel because unlike cutting, if you try to engrave on the top of the wheel, you'd put too much stress on the bearings in the rather delicate lathe. Anyway, going back to what this is all about and what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm just showing you a picture of Peter Rart of Logmeyer in Vienna, who some of you may know. He's another supporter, like Michael has been, of glass engraving and engravers, and particularly from this period of the 1990s, with the heyday of studio glass. And here he is listening to Erwin Eich, founder, of joint founder with Harvey Littleton of the studio glass movement at the 50th birthday party where we were all at Frauenau in Bavaria, where it all started. Peter saw the decline of glass engraving teaching in Europe as a largely due to the doctrines of the studio glass movement. And he was very worried because his company depends entirely on really fine workmanship. And even this was becoming rare and rarer from the Czech Republic. So he, held, he helped organize these amazing international glass engraving symposia that lasted a week every three years at Kamenevsky Shanov, which is the home of the oldest glass school in the world. Here are some of the students there in 2002 from Estonia, Australia, Czechia, Russia, Russia, Germany, Japan, Russia, Germany. Um, loads of extraordinary people, so interesting to meet them and learn from them. And this is at the same event. Uh, Professor Reni Rubicek, any of you who know um, modern Czech glass will know him as one of the great heroes of the 1950s modern Czech glass movement. And he's talking to Professor Jerzy Hartsuba here, probably the greatest 20th century uh, glass engraver from the Czech Republic. And at this 2002 symposium, I gave a talk about Save Call Save the Wheel, where I, where I said to the, to the whole group, don't let what has happened here in America and England and France happen to you. And don't lose your glass engraving classes from your glass schools because it's, it's dying out in England and it's dying out in America. And several people stood up and said, don't be so alarmist. Professor Yoshi Hartsuba even said, stood up and said, you don't need to teach it anymore people should be allowed to discover it for themselves. Well, I can tell you that it's awfully difficult learning how to do wheel engraving. And if you were there to learn it for yourself, you'd be there till Christmas. But sadly, in 2008, we had our last conference because uh, the local community ran out of money and the local glass school in kamenitsky Shenov lost interest in glass engraving. I fear, just as I'd predicted. So every summer, I, well, mo almost every summer, I used to teach a summer class for about three weeks at Bildwerk in Frauenau, which has a great su glass summer academy. And with some German friends, Wilhelm and Norbert Kaldhoff, we were sitting around having a, a miserable drink one evening, not just, just bewailing the fact 
that we had no more conferences and that glass engraving seemed to be severely threatened. So we decided that, that the only thing to do was to do a bit of self-help. The Guild of Glass Engravers was struggling as it was and certainly not able to do much about things going wrong in Europe. So Bilderberg very generously in September 2013 allowed us to use their buildings to summon five, approximately five uh, well-known engravers from all the different European countries that, where there were glass engravers to a little conference, a weekend conference. And here are some of them. And here's Helena Branova, who's the director of the museum at Kamenitska General. Anyway, uh, it was very successful. I persuaded them to divide into three groups so that we got as uh, much of an efficient um, uh, use of everybody's time as possible. Those who had any nows about things to do with the internet went off into a group to decide how we could become online and communicate with each other in the world. And for £10, which was our entire expense to start with, we bought a, a domain name through Facebook and we had a network page and a website. And with the network page, we now have a reach to over a thousand glass engravers all over the world, from Peru to Australia, Canada, and it's become a most marvelous way of communicating. The second group was given the brief of having to work out how we were going to organize ourselves. And we came up with the extraordinary idea that we weren't going to organize ourselves. We would not have a committee. We would have events in different countries and the engravers in that country would receive a summons and they would be responsible for making sure it worked. Um, it does mean we can't receive money from official countries and we can't run charities, but it gives a freedom and a flexibility which few other organisations have. I was involved with organising exhibitions and here I am with Wilhelm and Norbert and a couple of Dutch friends when we met in Groningen in the Netherlands to plan our first exhibition. Our first exhibition, we decided to maximize its impact by taking it on tour. Um, the two key languages of most of the engravers and most of the countries were either German or English. So we did a, a Denglish title, which was Gravure on tour. And um, we worked out a route and the rules were that we had the same exhibition of about 98 pieces of glass that moved from place to place. And the engravers in each country were responsible for the unpacking and setting out and packing of the exhibition on their patch and for the transport onwards. And so the Star Bridge exhibition started during the Biennale in uh, Starbridge in 2015. Um, it was squashed into two very small, well not two very small, but two small lit cabinets um, at the corner of a Guild of Glass Engravers exhibition. But it was a good start. Realizing that we were going to be sending work that was going to be unpacked and repacked seven times, everybody had to cooperate, which is asking a lot of glass engravers, by having a wooden box lined with foam with a hole in it with the glass object inside so that the packing wouldn't be destroyed by being packed and repacked. It's a learning curve about Europe, this exhibition. I discovered that there are 20, at least 20 different screw heads um, that were used on these wooden boxes and quite a lot of them are non-existent for screwdrivers in this country. Uh, there were quite a lot of things like that. And I didn't realize either that um, uh, VAT is different in every single country. So our price lists and pricing and tickets and labels 
all had to be redone in each country. But it was wonderful. We went each time to a glass museum or, sorry, a glass museum or um, gallery that was near a major glass school so that we could involve new students or glass students in glass engraving. One of the best ones were at Rheinbach, where the Peter Dreiser had learnt, where we joined with the glass students of the entire glass school in a massive workshop for a whole week using acid, glass cutting, glass engraving, um, sandblasting, laser cutting, it was a water jet cutting, it was really exciting. And we went, did the same at Kamenitsky Shenov next door to the school there, and uh, ended up at Flauernau, which has the glass the summer academy. Anybody who saw our exhibition might have seen this piece of glass by Heiko Schulze Hey, which it was called the Cone Connector. And the reason he'd done this one was because in 1820, some uh, German businessmen went from Hanover to Star Bridge to find out how this modern glass making was being done with these big coal furnaces in these cones. And they were so impressed, they came back to Peters Hagen, which is on the Elbe near Hanover, and built, you can see, 1826, built their own cone with a little village around it of, for the workers. And it's now a living industrial museum, and Heiko works there. But this was the link between the two surviving glass cones in the world. Now, Ursula Merker is not a, a wheel engraver. She's a sandblaster, but she does beautiful work. And it's modern work. So we had to, in, I had to include her in this talk. Um, you wouldn't believe it, but she's well into her 80s. Vigorous and wonderful artist. And she has done a load of work reintroducing printing from glass blocks. Engraved glass makes a wonderful printing medium. And she does a lot of illustrations and prints from her sandblasted glass. This is a wheel engraved glass block done by Jerzy Hartsuva. I, I bought it from Alan Poole and Dan Klein when they did an exhibition of work by Jerzy. And this is the print from that printing block. This printing block, you can still see the ink in it, but you can see what a, a fine modern print you can get out of from a, a, a glass block in a conventional glass print press. And as an aside, you can also take prints of very, very lightly engraved pieces. This is a thin sheet of glass that just had a, a, a coating of enamel on it that I cut away as an experiment. Um, and then using the back of a spoon as a, a press, took a, a very brief and, and a quick, as you can see, very rough and ready print of this simple piece of glass. In the past, before the days of photography, a, a jobbing glass engraver, wheel engraver, would, would take a rubbing of his work in case of disaster, in case he had to repeat his work, or a plaster impression. And this is a plaster impression of a portrait engraving by Dominic Beeman. And uh, quite a lot of these plaster impressions have turned out to be rather longer lasting than the poor glasses themselves who've survived two world wars and more. Anyway, going back to our first tour, we, we call for engravers who are interested from all over. And one of these engravers is probably uh, the only engraver we've ever come across in France, Nadege Breteau, who also makes her own glass. And she makes these extraordinary pieces that are both grals and engraved on the outside. Roisin de Butler is a glass blower and a great supporter and promoter of glass engraving as well as glass blowing in Ireland. 
uh, this piece isn't really engraved, it's, it's point engraved, but you can see a modern feel to this piece and her use of it with these wonderful shadows that it thro throws. A wheel engraver from the old Waterford factory, Greg Sullivan, is still going really strong. This is a piece that he's got in our current exhibition. And Greg teaches. He teaches copper wheel. So people who want to learn, if they don't want to learn in German or Czech, they can go to Greg and learn wheel engraving from him now, which is wonderful to know. Probably the most distinguished glass in wheeling, wheel, glass wheel engraver in, in Britain is Alison Kinnaird. Oh, it's not Bed of Roses I'm showing here. This is quite an old piece. It was a commission for John Keatley of a, a self-portrait of Alison. And I thought I would show you this because Alison is not only a wonderful glass engraver, but she's also a Klasach player. That's a traditional Celtic harp. And she tours and teaches all around the highlands and islands. Very, very gifted woman. And she's developed this amazing way of colouring her engravings. There are five sheets of clear glass here on a stand, inside which are some e uh, electric lights, over which each one, each sheet, has a little shard of dichroic glass. And this colours the glass as it lights up through the sheets of glass. So you can change the colours if you wish. Here's work by a young Czech engraver called Pavlina Chambalová. And she's working um, now mostly in glass. She started on hardstone and became in fascinated by glass when she studied under hard silver. And these little pieces are so sweet because she used lamp work to, to add to the pieces. Um, it's, it's a new use of glass engraving, which helps it to appeal to young students. Hunting scenes and golfing scenes and things like that simply don't appeal to young people and have had their day really anyway, I feel. Ioana Stelia from Romania looks very with it. She, she is a professor of glass at Bucharest University. And she makes these extraordinary great installations out of kiln formed glass, which she cuts and engraves both with the wheel and the drill. And she has done some enormous great sculptures of lots of shards of glass all, all joined together this piece called the dream quite extraordinary uh, they are amazing and she uses old spells and songs as as the refrains round these these pieces of glass now most brits will know ronald pennell as a wheel engraver this piece bird watching was in our first touring show and uh, He's well known. He started life as a metal engraver, you probably know, and went to, got a scholarship from Birmingham to go to um, Germany to, to learn more about metal engraving and came across glass engraving and never looked back. He does both still. Those of you who've been to the um, Starbridge Glass Festivals, may have met Christian Schmidt, who quite often gets invited to teach master classes in wheel engraving there. Christian, he, you might not have been able to talk to very easily because he's got this terrible stutter, but uh, all you need to do is to go to the pub. Uh, he's a terrific pop singer. When he's singing, he has no stutter at all. This is The Bed of Roses by Alison. Alison's got this amazing installation of seven sheets of glass. They're about 40 centimeters high, each of them. Each of them separately lit, held in a stand. And you can tell that on one sheet, there are only these 
pieces that are lit by a purple light. On another sheet, there's just the figure that's lit clear and the roses all have their own coloured lights. Here's Wilhelm loading everything into the van. This is at Conningen going, going before it goes on to um, Rheinbach. It was amazing. We managed to get everything into the whole idea was we measured it out that it would all fit in one large van. So nobody had to pay anything too much for shifting stuff. And here we are it demonstrating in the foyer of the um, Frauenau Museum at the end of the tour. We did this uh, game rather like Consequences. I don't know if those of you who are fairly old will remember playing Consequences on sheets of paper where you write a name and pass it along. Um, this is a, an engraving version of it. We engraved for 10 minutes on a piece of glass, a design or a picture of something or other, and then pass, after 10 minutes, passed it to our right. There were 12 of us, I think it was, in, um, in, in the foyer of the museum. And we made some fairly entertaining engravings. And these are some of the engravings we did which we tied together with uh, uh, some wire and, and left as, as, as a, an entertainment for the museum. The other thing we did as a bit of fun at the museum was to use a, an idea that Peter Rart had started in the Czech Republic at our symposia, which is to engrave a little shard of colour overlaid glass, Lambert's glass, about like a 35 millimeter slide and put it in a conventional slide projector. And here we are projecting them on the wall of the museum in Frauenau. It happened to be summer, but quite chilly even then up in the Bavarian forest. But uh, it's a fairly uh, unforgiving medium because you can see every chip magnified by miles, but it's good fun and uh, an entertainment. And here are some of the engravers. We look like quite a rabble, but I can assure you, here are some of the best and finest glass engravers in Europe. So it was a bit of a, a letdown after that had finished in 2016. We were all exhausted and wondering what to do next. But the curator of the glass museum at Immenhausen, uh, which is near Kassel, that's up near Hanover as well in Germany, uh, had been so impressed by our show, he invited us just to do a one-off show um, there with the, and he wanted us to do, um, use the Grimm Brothers tales as our theme because it was a ceremony and a celebration of the Grimm Brothers. And this is a piece of mine, um, which uh, I, I treated that this was the well, and I called it but where's my prince? And you look down the well and my prince was the fat old frog sitting in the bottom of the well, but all these other frogs around. Someone else who'd been impressed by our touring show was Ute Laren, who is one of the chief curators of the National Glass Museum at Rimaki, which is just north of Helsinki. It's the, the, the Finnish Glass Museum. And she determined that um, she would like to be responsible for reintroducing glass engraving to Finland, where there's a lot of really excellent modern glass going on, but no engraving. And the idea among most Finns that uh, glass engraving was something nasty that the Swedes did. Um, so to sort of prime the pump by inviting Wilhelm and Heiko to come up there for six weeks with as many um, portable lathes as we could round up and spindles and invite 12 budding young glass artists, Finnish glass artists, to come and explore glass engraving for themselves for six weeks. And uh, it was fully funded by the Finnish government. It was marvelous. And it was most successful. I can't show you all their work, 
But it was on the strength of that that we did our next tour, which we called Back On Tour, this time only to two centres, Remarque and Coburg, 2019 to 20. And we made a feature of the, um, the wonderful work that some of these Finns had done. This is the piece that was on the cover by Henrika Polanen. Um, I know it looks more like glass cutting than engraving, but she'd made this glass. And the thing that appeals to young glass makers is being able to work on their own glass. So they don't want to just be glass engravers. They want to be glass artists who can make and engrave. Kimo Renica is another Finnish glass engraver. He, he was a gardener in a glass factory until about five years ago. And then he, he was so in, interested about what was going on through the window in the cold workshop of the factory that he, the, the workers invited him in. And he's turned out to be a really inventive and interesting glass cutter and engraver. Yes, it alvo is a glass blower and he's experimenting. You can tell it's not a, a masterwork, this piece, but he's using his glass blowing to, to fire polish and to expand and to play with the glass. He's really taken off with glass engraving. We're so proud and pleased with his work. One of the German glass engravers involved with this uh, tour, both tours, is uh, Patrick Roth, who is working and living these days in Austria, in Bregenz. But he comes, he was a teacher at Rheinbach, and before then he was also a working for Lobmeyers in Vienna. And he does a lot of very modern work, as well as this piece, which is a really traditional piece and he's so versatile and that's what's impressive about a lot of these people who've been trained in the glass schools they are versatile they can do work for factories they can do work for themselves they can do modern they can do traditional mara sara is a well-known glass artist from estonia she was the professor of glass at tallinn university and famed more for her kiln work than her engraving. But engrave, wheel engraving is an integral part of her work as she's been cutting these piece, kiln form pieces. Yaroslava Votrubova from the Czech Republic works mostly on flat glass and works usually with very political um, topics this one is a bit more decorative. Tina Vunen, I'm rather proud of. She came on several of my courses and became interested in copper wheel. So interested that she decided she'd like to have a copper wheel lathe that was treble driven, not electric motor driven, so that she was uh, liberated from the 21st century. And that's what she's proceeded to do. She engraves on sheets of Lambert's glass. But the problem with copper wheel engraving is that it tends to be rather small scale. And when she went to the ICA, as uh, the glass um, art college at Mechelen in Belgium, she um, was persuaded to try and scale up, which she did in this way. This is a graduation piece which she called I Do, and it's about child brides in the northwest of Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And she made the dresses out of handmade paper herself and found a way of setting the glass into the paper, which she engraved with all the things that the child was missing and would never see again once she became a bride. Nancy Sutcliffe, well known here in the UK, is a very gifted glass artist and she had used the drill almost like a wheel engraver for a long time, but at last has realised that life will be even more exciting if she got a lathe and she's now working with a lathe as well. 
Anna Wenzel is uh, from Germany, north up in Flensburg, near on the near Danish border. She trained in Rheinbach, and she always does these comical, interesting commentaries on modern life. She calls this piece in the in the frame Gassi Gehen, which is sort of out on the street, and uh, it's always interesting. Um, sadly, she's got this wonderful German spelling mistake. Life begins after beer on his chest, but uh, always entertaining. Some of you will have seen this. As uh, Brian very kindly put this on the back of uh, the, the second to last Glass Matters magazine. In this last ex recent exhibition, back on tour. Joanna Stalia did an enormous installation called The Feast of the Fortune Teller. This is just one part of it. Fascinating, all these little runes and spells and uh, just marvellous. And these are some of the um, slides that we did at uh, Rimaki. And here we are at really Rimaki, some of us anyway. One of the people who was really impressed by us, I'm glad to say, was Sven Harshka, who is the director of the Kunstsammlung in uh, Coburg, as well as the director of the European Museum of Modern Glass at Röbenthal nearby. And he was so impressed by us that he shipped the entire 150 piece show from Rimaki at the museum's expense to Coburg. And he's written some wonderful things about us, as you can see. He thinks that maybe this uh, self-help group is, the sh is showing what's possible with modern engraving and showing what can be done and that there is a future. And I think it's really putting glass engraving back on the map. I think Michael would have been terribly pleased to have read this. Um, and uh, sadly, the exhibition started in March last year and it was meant to run till November. It was extended till March this year and it's just been taken down because it's had about 10 visitors and all the time it's been up. And uh, such a pity. But never mind, we're already planning another one this time to start in Spain and with the help of Paloma, who is the director of the Museum of the Royal Crystal Factory in San Ildefonso de la Granja uh, near Segovia, um, we shall be doing our first, the beginning of our next tour starting at La Granja, which is next door to a school. It looks a bit like a church, doesn't it? It was the Royal Factory that was built in this Greenfield site nearby the new Royal Summer Palace of the Bourbons in the early 18th century, at a time when you couldn't possibly bring window glass and chandeliers over the Guadarrama Mountains on mules. So it was easier to build a glass factory, which they built so big and it became the Royal Glass Monopoly and was working until about 1946 when they built a more per suitable um, factory just across the road. And they turned the sort of chapel and furnace room into the museum and the other side of the vast great granite building is the Escuela de, de los Vidrios and it's at the Escuela where we shall be running our master classes. The exhibition will be running on to France and then on to Pilsen in the Czech Republic and then, then possibly somewhere in Germany before we end in Vienna. So we have a good tour planned, but we all are waiting to see if we can do it in 2022. I'll just say as an aside, we're always looking for sponsorship. We've already had full sponsorship with, uh, for the last two tours and uh, it's through the generosity of sponsors that we've been able to do this. 
this is a view if we do the show do come and see it uh, La Granja is such a sweet and beautiful place uh, up in the mountains uh, this is these are the mountains up here and a little town with a massive great palace and a museum of tapestries as well as the museum of glass and uh, I've loved teaching there once my husband came out as well and even in June there was snow on the top of the mountains which he proved when he came down in the middle of my class with a bucket of snow and here in my last lot we did a, for about five years I taught a module of their degree course a month intensively here they are sitting on some old glass machinery behind the school but uh, that's it we're looking always for a new way to bring glass engraving to a new generation and it's through the help of people like Michael that it's all been possible thank you Yeah. Good. There we go. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Anybody have any questions for Catherine? Can I say something, um, Master? Can I say something? And next to it, the next one, then people will see you, I think. I'm not sure. As a, retired, as a very retired and antediluvian glass manufacturer, <laughs> uh, just to say how moved I was by Catherine's talk and to thank her and to oh, thank Michael please. for all yes. his support for the Guild because I don't think, having mm -hmm. been brought up on glass engraving, and I'm going to talk so about try the arrows, see if we can see it. In the sense that I and Catherine will be appalled by this. But I enjoy Sorry, I can't hear very well. Somebody's talking in the yes, background. Yes, somebody's talking over us. But yeah. I, I, when I started in 1960, we employed glass engravers, Catherine. I'm sorry to say that, but they were jobbing engravers. They, they worked in a row, three or four of them. I did my time, of course, in those days when you joined a factory, you had to. So I did my time and I know all about bouncing wheels. And of course at Stevens and Williams in the 1960s, if a customer wanted a, a, an inscription or a coat of arms, or let's say they had their own family uh, set of glass and they needed a replacement, uh, the engraver did it. But of course, compared with what Catherine does and what Michael has been supporting, it was rubbish engraving. Um, no, but it, no, got, no, it wasn't. It was jobbing engraving. It was valid. As, it as was... I got on, uh, we worked with Michael Fairbairn, who Catherine will know. Yes, I know well. Yeah. And uh, I tried to help uh, get him to help us to raise our standards. But, you know, it, it wasn't like that. And eventually, of course, Sandblast took over. But I would just like to ask Catherine because I, I was very, very moved, because this is an important skill. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it is, it's a sort of world heritage thing. I mean, she underplayed her skill enormously. I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, I'm 82, and I know what this involves. It is the most unbelievable skill, and it must somehow be preserved. So two questions. One is, from me, Catherine, mm -hmm. why did you say that the studio movement was anti-engraving? Was it because the emphasis is on gluing blocks of glass together rather than blowing glass? <laughs> and, no. secondly, and secondly, what is happening? Uh, are, there, are there any youngsters? I mean, are there sort of 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds coming into it with the wish to come into it? I mean, not, not in a factory, obviously, as a skill, as a studio craft, but are people doing that? Uh, and thank you again, Catherine, for your talk. Thank you, David. Well, to answer your first question, which was, um, oh, crumbs. Uh, studio uh, movement. Studio what movement. The what, studio what, movement the, the studio movement. movement started when Irving Eich and Harvey Littleton got together with a few other people. 
and started making glass in small studios. But they rapidly got this doctrine that there should be no surface treatment on the glass, yeah. no decoration. And part of this was because of Irving's personal problem with glass engraving. Irving's father was a glass engraver in Farnall. His family owned a glass factory. And Irving uh, served in the army during the war, came back, and his father sent him straight off to uh, glass school to learn to be a glass engraver. And he can't draw. And he hated it, absolutely hated it, and uh, decided that it wasn't for him. So he went off to art school in Munich, and, and that, that was history. But as soon as he had a chance to stick it in the neck for glass engraving, he did. And uh, everybody in America took Irving's words as gospel and took them very seriously. They did the same in the Royal College here in London. They used to have lathes and the, the technicians were giving away the lathes because they couldn't get anybody to do it anymore. Um, Starbridge College of Art was teaching wheel engraving until quite recently uh, and then gave up because nobody was learning. Kevin Andrew was trying to teach people but nobody was interested. As Steve Piper is probably his only successful pupil. Um, and the story of what happened in Ireland is the same with Waterford, Eamon Hartley and Greg Sullivan were wonderful portrait and special engravers, master engravers for Waterford. And when they were taken over, a chap came in with a stopwatch from America and said, we can't afford to have you guys doing this. Stop it. We, we, we just want a few twigs. We want it sandblasted. And um, it was a, a really bad time. People have grown up now. The people who were the studio glass movement in, 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 are now in their 80s. And uh, finally, I, I know people are settling down and uh, getting to grips with the fact that there might be some other things that got lost with the, you know, when the uh, throwing out babies with bathwater comes, comes to mind. But there are sufficient numbers of young engravers coming up that it's not going to grow completely die out. But what it's not going to do is go back to what it was before. The problem with people who are not fully trained, who don't do copper wheel engraving, is that when you want people to do restoration work or understand or appraise antique copper wheel engravings, they're unable to do it because they don't understand it. And that's my argument, that we should make sure that there are at least two or three people. But well, we're going to try to do this with our glass engraving network. Ensure that there are two or three people in every country who have a fully working knowledge and capacity with this technique so that it survives. Can't do any more than that. Catherine, I was... Yeah. Thank First you very much. Yeah. Catherine, I'd, I'd really like to thank you. You know how much Michael would have loved the evening all together. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to know whether your exhibitions that you're planning next year, are you going to have them online because people could be brought in to see them and maybe even pay to have a viewing? Um, oh, yes, is, we hope to. I, we, we have very few of us would be able to get to the places that you've Sure. I, I mean, the plan for... Easter next year seemed so many millennia away when we started planning yes. this. And oh, it's unlikely that many people will get there. So of course we have to do this. But I think this is part of the future for a lot of uh, touring exhibitions. Yes. That uh, those who can't get there will be able to see it online. And Sven Hauschke got a wonderful film made of Coburg and uh, it was on telly. And in that respect, we got more coverage than we might have done because the directors of the museums are so keen to, to show. Good. And uh, if I might just um, also say, I knew that Catherine wouldn't show very much of her own engraving. So I bought a, my favorite piece. I don't know whether you can see it. This is this wonderful bowl. 
engraved on the outside with camellias. It's a green, well, you can, you can describe it better than me, Catherine, but it's, it's a heavy piece of glass and it's hollowed out in the center so that when you look into it, you see different perspectives of the engraving. It, it's so clever and you can feel all the engraving on the outside. It's absolutely beautiful. This was a period that you went to Japan, I think, was it? Yes. Mm. I don't know whether people can see it, but it's a wonderful color. And it was is inspired by Japanese tea, which is uh, made from a camellia bush, white flowers. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah. It's very much at night. <laughs> can, I, can I have a question? Have yes. A question. Lo lovely. You're a very, very busy lady talking to lots of different groups at the moment. Yeah. Well, I fear that everybody's going to go to sleep eventually. Yeah, so I <laughs> bore on about glass <laughs> engraving <laughs> long enough. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> it was wonderful. But well, I was horrified when you actually said only 10 people got along physically to Coburg. Was this just because of the COVID and lockdown? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, because we were going to have an opening and we're going to, we were going to, we're, in October this year, we're hoping to have a meeting and demonstration in the museum, but I have little hope that even that's going to happen. Mm. And I'm not going to talk about having to pay 300 odd pounds to get my glass back through customs. Oh, blimey. <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing is I've been so involved with that group and uh, Brexit has been a, a disaster for us. Okay. So let's hope that the next one really goes well. And great Thank idea you. from Jenny to have it online as well. So yes, uh, it is. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think Peter wants to say something of Michael's brother. He's uh, Paul. Michael's brother's uh, muted. Can you unmute him? He can unmute himself. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just see if I Take can away find the it. line through the mute. Oh, it's not a, he's not on as Peter, is he's on at some CM. CM's iPad Air to Caroline. Yes. Yes. Caroline. Yes, there it is. I've asked him to unmute. While we're waiting, oh. may I ask oh. a very oh. quick He's done it. Go on, Mary, go on. Yeah. May, may I ask a very quick and a very mm. basic and ignorant question because I know nothing about glass engraving. I'm fascinated to know about colour, how you obtain colour mm. and, and where you get your pieces of glass from if you're not blowers and makers yourselves. Right, well, I get my glass blown by, to, to my design, by a pair of very gifted glass blowers down in Cornwall. It's, it, as, as David Williams Thomas will, will assure, uh, surely back me up saying how skillful it is getting a very thin skin of colored glass, it's called an overlay, over the outside of clear glass or whatever other glass you want. You have to make two bubbles, uh, blow them together and push them together and pull the outer skin over the out the the uh, the clear glass, which is like turning red rub, hot red hot rubber gloves inside out, without getting a fold or trapping a bubble. It's the most incredibly um, skilled job. So I do loads of technical drawings, go down there, and we spend a whole week at the glass blowers making enough pieces for me, which is about 15 pieces. It takes me. All I can do is to do 15 in a year and less than that at the moment. Um, and they all have to be annealed because they're very thick walled for at least a week after they've been blown. They so have to be what? Annealed. That's put in a kiln and gently, gently cooled down. Because if you don't cool down the glass gently after it's blown, it all cracks up with stress. The glass is a very strange material. It's even worse than toffee. It's never really molten and it's never really set. And so when you've blown it, it then has to go into a kiln where it 
very gently cools down. A table glass will only take about five hours probably to anneal, but uh, that little bowl of Jenny's would have taken at least four or five days. I suppose that's where you get the term, the state of flux. <laughs> yes, if I could say, um, gl mm. glass is technically a supercooled liquid, I think. Yes, that's and right. And if you, if you put a new pane of glass in your window and measure the bottom of it, and let's say it's, I don't know, three millimetres, come back in a hundred years, it'll be four millimetres. <laughs> that will have flowed down and it will, it will have you, flowed. When you can him, press my face. Mm. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Peter, you wanted to say something. Yes, may, may, may I say two things before a question? The first is, I now know why Michael, my brother, uh, so admired Catherine Coleman. What a wonderful lecture she's given us all. And uh, I've seen some of her other works, not shown this evening, and how impressed one always is by what one sees. The second thing before my question is to say that Michael's original inspiration must have been our father, who was master of the Worshipful Company of Glass Sellers as far back as 1935 at the age of 43, which was the Silver Jubilee year of King George V, and he arranged uh, for the glass sellers to give the most beautiful uh, engraved, quite large uh, fruit bowl, I'd call it, uh, a, a photo of which I have, and I hope the, the company has. My question is, <laughs> is, oh yes, uh, Catherine has been very modest because she was one of the artists who uh, took part in the, uh, in the uh, glass sellers companies uh, gift which Michael arranged for Downing Street, uh, where I think there were five or six different uh, glass makers, including Catherine, who produced this wonderful set of 42 glasses, of 42 works of art made of glass. And I didn't know whether there's time for Catherine today just to mention that particular subject. Certainly. Um, actually, I wasn't one of the engravers who did any work for that Downing Street collection, mainly because at the time I was just too busy when the call went out but I was very honoured to help Michael put the catalogue together. And that was really um, a pleasure to do. And um, Michael really wanted to, to promote glass as far as he could by getting it into Downing Street. And it was really a shame that um, sadly, just as politics is a movable feast, that the timing didn't fit better for, for, for the Downing Street collection. That being said, it is wonderful that that beautiful catalogue came out for Michael to see. And uh, I think everybody who's involved with it and that the, the subject, for those of you who don't know the Downing Street collection, it's, it's a collection with the most exquisite architectural engravings on it. Tracy Shepherd, who I think is here tonight, uh, did some particularly good ones. And um, there, there were some fabulous engravings on both decanters and whiskey glasses. I including some by the late Hilary Virgo. Yes, Hilary and Virginia Bliss and Josephine Harris, a lot of the great names of the 1990s, 1980s and 90s. Yes. Brilliant yes. idea. Can I yes. just say that if anybody's interested in knowing the story of the Downing Street collection, it is actually on the Glass Sellers website, 
um, you, what you'll need to do is you'll need to go to um, the tribute to the father of the company, Michael Nathan, on the Glass Cellars news channel. And at the bottom, there is a link, which is an article about the Downing Street collection, which Michael commissioned. So you can look at that. It's quite an interesting article. And as I say, it's linked on that um, tribute to Michael on the Glass Cellars website. Thank you. May I and ask it, a question? And if, if, I'm, if I may say so, the idea to go ahead with it uh, arose when uh, Michael happened to meet at a charity event at Downing Street, jo John Major, when he was Prime Minister, mm. saw the silver collection and said to John Major, why not gl a glass collection? Quite correct. That, that was the beginning. Thank well, you. Thank you. John Major was the patron of the um, Guild for some time. And uh, he, he there, then, when he became Prime Minister, he, he had to step down. Um, but we had the Queen Mother as a patron as well. So uh, Michael and co managed to sweep in a, a huge number of distinguished people to, to front our, our little guild. Yes. Thank you very Can much. Thank question? you. Ask yes. I'm Caroline. Um, I wondered, um, Catherine, if you can tell, you've told us that the younger generation um, perhaps don't like the challenges of copper wheel engraving mm -hmm. and, um, well, what the glass engraving that you do, that it's messy, they get in a mess, they don't like that, and this and that, and it's very challenging, takes many years to um, become accomplished. Mm. So where where does it start? I mean, you may have actually said it. Where, where did you start? Do you go to art school and some, and there is a course on blowing, cutting, whatever, mm. glass, or how does it begin? Well, in this country now, it, it tends to be people learning from summer schools, or, or I teach at Morley College in, in Lambeth, they're mm. currently not. Um, and I was forced to get rid of all the, the wheel engraving lathes because the mm -hmm. health and safety uh, department of Morley College considered that they weren't safe for the use of students. I pointed out that glass was quite dangerous too, so <laughs> what was the problem? But um, that was the ruling. Um, but so for those really who, encouragement right from the start. What no, I, I can teach drill engraving and we have two portable lathes. But that's enough to get people interested. And then I can point them at Greg Sullivan or um, the Czech Republic, because people who are really focused and dedicated will be able to get a scholarship or something to go and spend. What you need is at least an intensive year to really get a grip on wheel engraving. I, I was uh, nothing to do with glass and there was no way of learning glass engraving when I started in 1984. And that's already quite sort of long ago now. Um, I was in, you know, my forties and um, I, I just happened to see some in modern engraved glass in a gallery window and left my children who were then in pushchair and everything on, on the pavement and Cork Street, abandoned my children, rushed in and said, where do you do this? Where can I find out about it? And they said Morley College because Peter Dreiser, this wonderful in engraving artist from Germany, happened to be teaching there. Because he didn't have a degree, he wasn't allowed to teach at a university here in Britain but he could teach at an adult education college. And those in the know appreciated that. I taught after he, he sadly got cancer and died, I taught there in his place. But sadly, I got the sack because although I taught uh, historical geography at London University, that wasn't enough to be a, a teacher training qualification. And I wasn't prepared to pay to get a teacher's training qualification for a whole year simply to teach for three hours once a week. And so they sacked me. <laughs> um, and they invited me back 
when I was over 70 because employment law is different for the over 70s. So I can now teach and do what I like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, uh, that's all. Thank you. Could well, I just say, I say something? Which, uh, one is, thing. Is, is it possible? Um, the Downing Street collection was promoted by the Glass Engraving Trust which was a yes. trust set up uh, by Michael. And I believe, Jenny, you have yep. got a number of uh, spare copies. Uh, yes, yes, we catalog. have. So if anybody wants, excuse me for offering it, Jenny, but I know you've got a pile of them. No, I'd be delighted. Good idea, Jim. Good idea. Catherine. Yes, I, re I relate to so much what you just said about about teaching, because um, I was a craft teacher in adult education, and uh, I had to go to County <laughs> Hall for an interview, and um, they said to me, um, "You're not sufficiently arts trained," mm -hmm. and I was I was a trained teacher. But they said I wasn't sufficiently arts trained for the subjects I wanted to teach. Mm. And they sent me off to do a city and guilds. And I have taught at Morley College well, so oh, right. since then. Mm. I do book binding. Oh, that's the same studio where the glass engraving happens. Oh, right. <laughs> Room C32. <laughs> And when I was learning, all all the all the new girls and boys, the the, the, the useless ones, had to um, wobble around on those boards over the book presses because they yes. weren't really stable tables. It yes, was only the right. more, more uh, advanced pupils who got the stable benches. How <laughs> funny! Was working men's college before. Could I just? Uh add something. First of all, congratulations, Catherine, for a most magnificent presentation. Thank but you. Uh, one of the things that um, I'm interested in, and I wonder whether you can throw some light on it, is it was quite interesting to me that my adopted country, which, which I lived for many years, was one major country in Europe that was not mentioned, I think, in your, in your presentation. Italy. Now, when, Italy, quite. When I, when I moved to, to Italy in, in 1982, in fact, at Colle di Valdelsa, which was quite a considerable glass centre, still is to some extent, but suffering mm. from, from Far Eastern imports, um, my, a friend of mine was actually running a workshop where there were several wheel engravers to, mm. running a commercial, commercial workshop. Now, unfortunately, this disappeared in the way that you so so vividly described. But uh, I wonder whether you had any idea of what whether anything goes on in Italy now, or whether you had any 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 views on it. Yes, there there is quite a bit of engraving. Obviously, Murano has uh, several engravings, including Matteo Seguzzo, who's a very good engraver. Um, they tend to engrave using traditional designs. There isn't much sign of anything contemporary going on there with engraving, but we are hoping to, to run a workshop there one day. The problem is with Italy is that it's so commercialized that we can't find anywhere affordable to either do an exhibition or run a workshop. I mean, we're always on the search for these things because what we want to do is to push out. We, we're aware that, you know, Italy, the other thing, of course, is that Italy doesn't make good, good, very nicely, nice glass to engrave. It, it's uh, hard crystallo and, and, and uh, hard glass that tends to chip very badly and is very difficult to cut and polish. Um, there are very few making lead crystal or even glasses with a tiny proportion of lead to soften it but uh, or overlaid much i mean that they're, they're overlays they tend to underlay rather than overlay um mm. that being said we're always looking and matteo seguso is very vociferous about the fact that we've ignored him so long so we are hoping one day to make it to italy Colle still refers to itself as the city of crystal 
Um, mm. I think the the mayor and, and, and the junta of Colley would be quite interested in in re igniting the artistic side of, of the collie industry. Some lead crystal is still made in collie. There's oh, some right. from, from, uh, from quite a lot of uh, uh, Far Eastern imports, but then that's problem oh, in, the problem in Venice certainly as well. So, but, It's the uh, same in I, the Czech Republic. It's the same in, in Poland. Yeah. The only place yeah. where it's not happening and it's, it's being kept in this wonderful bubble is actually Russia where there's some fantastic engraving going on. And I'm still in touch with, because of that time I was in the Czech Republic was that moment when Russians could still come in and out of the Czech Republic. I made a lot of contact with Russians and uh, there was a big conference uh, with the Hermitage and the State Glass Museum in St. Petersburg this March, which I sadly uh, couldn't go to, but they did invite me to come and talk about European glass there. So uh, I'm hoping that we can bring Russia into the um, into the fold as well, because uh, I don't see why it just has to be EU countries. Catherine. Thank you. Yes. It's Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello. How are you? Um, I just think you've demonstrated what a wonderful contribution you've made, to, A, to British glass engraving, but more importantly, probably to glass in general in the Britain. I think you should actually move for an MBE to be a DBE of the glass world. And, no. and that has to do, in my view, with your generosity. And you've demonstrated that tonight. Um, you, when I did, the, I think, the first online um, uh, lecture, for, for A, the glass sellers, and B, the various other people, as you know, um, you insisted on replacing one piece of glass that I bought off you, saying it wasn't of sufficient quality. Well, I, I think I got a hugely good deal. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to make that point. I also want to make a point about, I, actually, it's interesting. I was going to, you were talking about online exhibitions. I don't know how many people watching have been to the Stanza del Vetro, wonderful exhibition of American, the influence of Venice on American glass. It's probably one of the most important glass exhibitions almost in ever since 1960. And it's about all the contribution to, uh, by the Murano. And it's in the Stanza del Vetro. And it's a really interesting way because the whole thing has had to be online in the end. And I, I would be very willing to help you think about ways to put um, gravure on tour or whatever the next uh, iteration is going to be online. Because it really interests me as to how to put collections online. Um, but I do have one question at the, at the end of this mm -hmm. ramble. Um, and that is, what, wh how do we make the future of glass engraving in Britain better or bring it back or whatever the right aspiration is? I think we need to capture the imagination of students at glass colleges. And I think the only way we can do that is to make work that relates to the forms and the language, the uh, visual language that is, is part of modern art. I think al although figurative and exquisite uh, in fine engraving is, 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 is beautiful and admired by older people. It's of little interest to, to the young. What they like is uh, surface textures and wild free marks made on glass. And I think if we can help um, capture them that way and then persuade them that they need to upskill and then they can make better marks. I think through that, we may persuade young people to take more interest in, in engraving. I think sometimes as well, it will shift. It'll jump a generation. My kids, my children, my son and daughter were never interested in the slightest with anything I did really in the way of with, with glass engraving. But my grandchildren are absolutely smitten with it. For their Christmas presents, as soon as they were 10, 
I gave both my granddaughters glass engraving little micromotor drills mm -hmm. with um, uh, the, the progress of the nail bar, the, the progress in the technology of making drills, electric drills, has, is transformed into these lovely little light hand-driven tools. And both my, my granddaughters, one of who's now 14, engraved like angels. And I think it, it may be that if we don't bother with the, the 40, 50 year olds, except to welcome them and their, their financial contribution to the, all the hobby classes, because they come in droves for them. Um, but we focus on the young and uh, go directly in. But we have to capture the administrator's interest. That's the problem. And as soon as you say glass engraving, people have a very fixed idea of what they're going to see. That was my difficulty when I first started in the 1980s. Um, in the days before, um, we had uh, online and, and digital pictures. Everything was on photographic slides, which were expensive. And I would ring galleries. I had no Royal College of Art uh, pedigree or anything like that. And I would ring a gallery before I sent them slides saying, may I send you my slides in case you'd be interested in my work? And they say, oh yes, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a glass, uh, I'd say, um, well, I'm working with colored glass, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they'd say, oh yes, where did you study? Royal College? And I'd say, no, where, where did you study? And I'd say, Morley College. What on earth is that, they'd say. And uh, then they say, and what do you do? And I say, I'm a glass engraver. And the phone would go down. They wouldn't even look. And I think I was probably making better work then than I am now. And it's so sad, but people's prejudice often makes it a very difficult barrier. And that's why, as you say, we've got to find a way of making it appeal to, to a new generation. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just say, we could go on all night being totally mesmerized. Oh golly, I've talked too long, sorry. No, you haven't at all, Catherine. We are totally mesmerized by your infatuation and your craft. It has been an absolute privilege, but I really think that I don't want to expire the enjoyment because I do want to have the opportunity to invite you back on another occasion oh, yes, because please. we all enjoy you so much. Thank but you. what I'd like to do to sort of come to an end is firstly, before I ask the master to say good night, is to ask the chairman of the charity fund, Lee Baildham, to say a few words. Lee, would you please? Most definitely, Mr. Clark. Catherine, thank you so much. Um, as you know, my, my heritage, or you may recall my heritage, was in the very far north of Scotland at Kate Ness Glass. Mm. And, uh, I know you know Dennis Mann, and yes. uh, for those that aren't familiar, um, the great copper wheel engraver of uh, the BBC Mastermind Trophy, which of course I think was probably one of the great adverts for copper wheel engraving um, that most people have heard of, but mm. perhaps didn't know where it came from. Um, Catherine, sincerely, um, I stood as um, a relatively young man in Wick watching Dennis Mann um, in absolute astonishment, um, copper wheel engraving. Uh, I don't think anybody, and I'm sure there are many people here this evening that have actually watched the copper wheel engraver work. Um, the extraordinary skill and detail that you can get underneath uh, what I would see as a black mass of oil and grinding powder. <laughs> you can't actually even see what you're doing. How on earth you get the detail um, is still a mystery to me, even though um, I progressed through the company and thoroughly enjoyed my time there. <laughs> but sincere thanks. Jenny, Thank you. thanks to you and um, the busload of your family that you have bought, your relatives and so on, obviously um, to listen to Catherine. Yeah. But the one thing that we've talked about in terms of Michael and um, his great passion for glass engraving was, of course, his great passion for the glass sellers and most very specially the charity fund. Yeah. Um, 
Very recently, I was um, very uh, well, completely honoured to take over from Professor John Whiteman as chairman of the trustees. And when Paul um, chatted with me, um, as also a trustee of the charity fund, and said, um, what do you think? Um, Michael, as we know, sadly passed away, uh, and he is sorely missed from our meetings and from the contributions that he personally gave um, to each and every one of us. Um, but of course, we all know of his extraordinary generosity um, of spirit and indeed very much of money. And I hate to say it, but tonight, of course, has been an extraordinary success, not just in promoting the wonders of um, beautiful engraving um, and the challenges that face us, but also it's been a huge success from the charity fund point of view. And Jenny, thank you for allowing us to use Michael's name uh, in this inaugural lecture and in subsequent years. I can tell all of you that we have raised in excess of £1,500 this evening with this gathering. Um, those of you that have heard me before um, will now know that I am totally shameless and will say that if you haven't um, gift aided whatever you've paid and anything else, and if after this amazing event you feel um, that you wish to give some more to our charity fund, then please, please don't be shy. And what does it do? Well, today I have actually been speaking with a group of schools, uh, a representative with a group of schools as far away as Cornwall, because our Glass in Society initiative, which reaches out to schools across the United Kingdom to talk about the modern technological uses of glass, but also glass as a sustainable material. So exactly what Catherine was speaking about how do we get young people involved? And the answer is at the very, very earliest opportunity. And that is what Glass in Society does. So tonight, you have, all of you, each and every one of you, have contributed to at least one Glass in Society project across the United Kingdom, and possibly even another one if we can get some more support. So sincere thanks to Jenny. Michael, I know you're watching us and I know you're listening to all of this and smiling away as you always did. And then saying, and why haven't you raised even more money? <laughs> so thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, thank you everybody for um, taking part in a, a wonderful event that will change children's views of glass for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Lee. And can I invite the, the master of the company to say good night to everybody? Hi, Ina Lee. Let me say, as master on behalf of the Glass Sellers Company, Catherine, thank you for a masterly overviewing of glass engraving, especially using the copper wheel over recent years throughout Europe. It really was an amazing um, display of artists and their art. It was a fitting tribute to Michael indeed, who did so much to promote the art of glass engraving. Um, and we, you and, uh, and we have a lot to be thankful to Michael for. You yourself are an amazing champion of the art um, and promoting it, as well as being a brilliant practitioner yourself, quite clearly. Jenny, thank you so much for agreeing to allow this lecture to go ahead in Michael's honor. Um, he really would have loved to have been here, but then it wouldn't have been his honor. Uh, but it was also lovely to see so many of Michael's family with us. Thank you mm -hmm. all so much. And thank you all for taking the time and trouble to attend this wonderful evening. And um, as um, Lee has already said, for contributing so generously towards our charity. Thank you all very much indeed, and I wish you good night.
Nice. Good night. Good night. All right, everybody. Good night. Thank you again, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.